The Leader of the Opposition, Senator Hill. Uh, Mr President, uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the document just tabled. Is leave granted? There's no objection. Leave is granted. Senator I Hill. move that the, that the Senate Chamber 1 notes the refusal of the government to comply with the direction contained in the Senate's resolution of Tuesday, 10 December, to lay on the table of the Senate the tape recording of the discussions held on 4 September 1991 between the Minister for the Arts, Sport and the Environment, Tourism and Territories and representatives of conservationist groups. Two further notes that this refusal to lay the tape on the table is not based on any claim of executive privilege. Three, is of the opinion that, subject only to reasonable claims of executive privilege, both Houses of Parliament are fully entitled to scrutinise and demand accountability for all aspects of executive behaviour. Four, notes with great concern the government's apparent belief that, that it is not accountable to the people of Australia through the parliament. Five, accordingly censures the government for its unjustified failure to comply with the Senate resolution of 10 September. And six, calls upon the government to comply with the resolution of the Senate this day. Uh, Mr President, uh, for the benefit of honourable senators who, who wouldn't have notice of the details of the letter uh, of the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Button, which was given to the clerk yesterday in reply to the order of the Senate. I will read that letter. He writes, Dear Mr Evans, I refer to your letter of 10 September regarding the order agreed to by the Senate yesterday relating to the tape recording of discussions held between the Minister for the Arts, Sport and Environment, Tourism and Territories and representatives of the conservationist groups. I have noted the text of the order and advised the Senate that the government will not be tabling the tape according to which it refers. I would point out, however, that the Prime Minister today read to the House of Representatives a transcript of the relevant part of the recording, a copy of which is attached. Mr President, attached to that letter is a quote as follows, which claims to be a transcript extract from Peak Conservation Organisation meeting dated 4 September 1991. In quotes, I've really outlined the sort of structure of the EPA and where that's going. I'll just go into the intergovernmental agreement. The first draft, let me tell you about the inter intergovernmental agreement, as you know, has, basic, has emerged basically from the Prime Minister's initiative for the states and is really crass politics at the lowest common denominator. It's all about mainly the people who are involved in it. Um, it are not the environmental ministers or their departments, the premiers, and the bottom line for them all is the bucks, the big dollars. They would sell their mothers for a few bucks, and so the bottom line of much of this negotiation is what we, if they get what they want on transport and housing in terms of untied grants and social services security, they would give us anything. If they don't, they're going to make our lives. If they don't, they're going to make our lives a misery, and that's not very satisfactory. But that's the harsh reality of it. That, uh, Mr. President, is the government's answer to the order of the Senate that it lay before the Senate uh, a certain tape recording. In other words, the government refuses, and it refuses without giving any reason. No claim of crown privilege. No claim that it's a matter of national security or its cabinet in confidence or its commercial in confidence or whatever, just a blatant refusal to comply with the order of the Senate. Mr President, uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, uh, if certain ministers of the government with a reasonably long memory pricked their ears when I read uh, uh, the, uh, the motion uh, that I've put before the Senate today. And they'd prick their ears because they would realise that it's very much in the same terms as a motion moved by Senator Evans as Shadow Attorney General in 1982. At that time, apparently, Senator Evans believed that the executive was responsible to the parliament and that the Senate was fully entitled to scrutinise and demand accountability for all aspects of executive behaviour. One might wonder, Mr President, what's changed. Of course, what's changed is simply power. The government is now in power, Senator Evans is now in power, and his attitude to the responsibility of the executive to the parliament has changed. It is not politically expedient for the government to provide this tape because it could be politically embarrassing, and so they simply disregard the order of the Senate. That's unsatisfactory, Mr. President, and this Senate, in my submission, has no alternative, therefore, but to move this censure motion. 
It is an important issue, Mr. Mr President, there is no doubt about that, and I will get to it in a moment. But it is also important, the question about which the tapes relate, the question of new federalism. There is a feeling by some perhaps the issue at stake, other than the issue of the responsibility of the executive of the parliament, is not of the same consequence as some of the previous orders that have been made over the years. Mr President, that's not so. It's not so because we all know in a situation where there are about one million Australians unemployed that this country requires major structural reform. One area of structural reform, which everyone accepted, is in the area of the relationship between the, the Commonwealth and the state, so that there can be a more efficient administration in both. It has been promoted by the Prime Minister, and we accept that. If, however, a minister, a senior minister of the Crown, says to conservation groups the Prime Minister is not serious, that the Prime Minister is simply engaging in a political game, that he is simply engaging in crass politics, that is a serious matter because it demonstrates to the people of Australia that this government is not serious about restructuring the relationship between the states and the Commonwealth in the way that it has claimed that it desires to do so. Therefore, the, the determination by Minister Kelly, as she put to these conservation leaders, that the Prime Minister is about crass politics is a very serious, very serious matter. We are entitled to be concerned, Mr President, because we have on the record so many examples where this Prime Minister, despite the fact that there are a million people unemployed in this country, still believes that he has some God-given right to rule and that he is beyond reproach and beyond question. And that should never be allowed to occur. We have had demonstration in recent times of how he cynically regards the Australian people, no better demonstrated by the conspiracy between Mr Keating and Mr Hawke to deceive the Australian people at the last election, lied to the Australian people about their intentions as to who would, who would remain Prime Minister after the election. We are entitled to be concerned, therefore, Mr President. The Australian people are entitled to be concerned because they have had it demonstrated time and time again that this Prime Minister will play whatever political tricks are necessary to remain in government. And here it appears that he is playing another one because Minister Kelly advises senior conservation leaders that this new federalism is simply a game of crass politics. That's the way that it was interpreted by a number of the major conservation leaders present at the meeting. And there is one simple way in which the matter can be resolved forever, and that is if the government was prepared to do the right thing, put the tape on the table and let the people of Australia have the opportunity to peruse it. And that's all that's being asked. And one must wonder again and again, Mr President, why the government won't comply with that requirement. What is unreasonable about the people of Australia being entitled to hear the tape and determine who is telling the truth, the leaders of the conservation movement who have been defamed by Minister Kelly or whether it is Minister Kelly? Why is she continuing to refuse to do that and to clarify the matter and to let the people make the judgment? And one can only suspect as to the outcome. But apart from the important question of the merits of the case, Mr. President, there is the even more important question of this, uh, this government's decision to blatantly and deliberately undermine the democratic structure by rejecting the request of the Senate uh, to, table this, uh, to table this document. As I said, Mr. President, this is an arrogant government which puts itself above the responsibility to the people through the parliament. Ministers are not directly elected by the people. It is the parliament that is elected, and the safeguard upon the executive is the right of the parliament uh, to pass orders and for the executive to count to it. Account to it. It's an unquestioned principle of, constitution, of the constitution, Mr. Deputy President, which, as I said, Senator Evans was pleased to propound in this place in 1982, but which this government is now going to regard when it suits its political expediency. To this government, it is a nuisance. The parliament itself is a nuisance. It is a distraction. But we will never allow that to be the case. The Senate has passed its order. The order of the Senate must be complied with, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. President. When the executive assumes an authority beyond that of the parliament, that is, those directly elected by the people, a cornerstone of our constitutional democracy is threatened. That is why the refusal to comply 
with the order of the Senate is in fact a rarity. You might be interested to know, Mr. Dep Mr. President, that there have been over 20 cases in which such orders have been passed by the Senate. On only two occasions, only two occasions was the order not complied with, and it's something that the government should take into account. Why do governments normally, with only two exceptions since the time of the Constitution, comply with such orders? Because they recognise they owe a responsibility to the parliament, because they recognise that if they disregard the parliament, they are undermining a cornerstone of our democracy. Mr President, there have been a whole range of orders. They have covered all sorts of, uh, all sorts of matters over the years. Uh, they have related to uh, forest products, the, the first one in 1924, uh, another one in 1931 regarding the Commonwealth Bank, correspondence between the government and the Commonwealth Bank, another in 1931 regarding the um, correspondence between the Labor Party and the acting Prime Minister, 1931 again correspondence regarding Jarvis Bay. I won't read them all, but the point I want to make is they are a range of different issues covering matters of varying importance. But whether they go to the, to the most vital matter in the national interest or otherwise, the practice of governments has been to accept that the structure of the Constitution will only work if they respect the dignity of the parliament, if they respect the orders of the parliament and duly comply. Only two exceptions, I said, Mr. President. One in 1975 and one in 1982. In 1975, the Senate called before it uh, the departmental officers to answer questions relating to the Kemlani loan affair. Those departmental officers claimed Crown privilege, an impasse developed, and the matter was never, was never resolved. What then followed was the double dissolution and election, and the government was, was defeated. The next, instance, the next instance was in 1982. That was an action brought in the Senate by Senator Evans, as I indicated a moment or two ago. It, related to the, it, it, it was Senator Evans bringing, bringing a case for the production of legal opinions that concerned the bottom of the harbour cases. In the first instance, the government of the day complied with that by tabling a whole series of documents that Senator Evans required. But certain legal opinions it wasn't prepared to do so because it claimed they had Crown privilege. I remind you there's no issue of Crown privilege in what this government has said today, according to Senator Le Button's letter. There's no claim of any justification at all. But in 1982, the government of the day claim Crown privilege in relation to legal documents, legal opinions, and that's, uh, that's not unusual. Mr President, I thought that you might like to know uh, what Senator Evans said about the responsibility of the, of the uh, government to the parliament in this in in these instance. And I refer to the, the Hansard of the 8th of September 1982. He said it was important that these documents be tabled to enable the parliament and the community as a whole to form its own view, exactly what we have said today. He went on, the only way that blame can begin to be established and rightly located is by the tabling of all the information, all the relevant documents that will enable an even better judgment to be made of the situation than we have been able to make so far. Again, he continued on the same day in the Senate, he said, I believe that access to these documents will enable, if not the whole truth to emerge finally, at least, uh, at least us to get some distance down that particular track. You will be surprised, Mr President, to learn that Senator Evans said, we have chosen the path of moderation and reasonableness. That's <laughs> In that instance, it was regarded by Senator Evans to be both moderate and reasonable that the Senate should expect those documents in the same way that it's more than moderate and reasonable that the Senate be entitled to this tape in the public interest today. He continued, he repeated it time and time again, occasionally he can be repetitious. He said, in order that we and the public at large can get better, a better form, can better form a view as to where the blame lies, where the merits lie and where the truth lies in this matter, the documents must be, must be produced. Mr President, exactly the same position exists today. The Senate is entitled to this, 
document in this instance and papers by practice in the, of the Senate have included tapes because it's in the public interest that the public be entitled to learn where the truth lies in this particular, particular instance. And what did Senator Evans do at the end of that process when he was unsuccessful in getting those documents? He moved a censure motion, as I said, in almost the identical terms that the opposition is moving it today. And he was, of course, overtaken in that instance also then by an election and the issue was never, never finally, finally resolved. So, Mr. President, we demand, what we demand today is exactly as Senator Evans demanded in 1982. The Senate made an order two days ago. The government has failed to comply with that order. It's made no claim of executive privilege. Even if it had made a claim of executive privilege, we would, consistent with our long-held view and consistent with the authorities as contained in Hodges, say that it is ultimately for the Senate to decide whether the, whether the, the stand of executive privilege should be upheld or not. But this, as I said, was simply an arrogant refusal of this government to, to comply. The government has tabled part of a transcript which clearly can be read in exactly the way the conservationists have said that it should be read. The letters tabled by Minister Kelly in the House of Representatives yesterday did not contradict that point of view. That was the view of four conservationists that, that Minister Kelly was saying that the Prime Minister was indulging in nothing more than crass politics. We heard it again from the, statesman, the spokesman from Greenpeace this morning, the same interpretation of what Minister Kelly has said. And of course, it wouldn't be surprising if that's what she was saying, because she's supporting Keating, Mr. Keating, in the leadership contest. It's in her interest to undermine the position of the Prime Minister. As I said a moment ago, the only way the people of Australia can know for certain is by listening to the tape. If Minister Kelly was innocent, there is one way, one simple way, in which she can demonstrate it. While she refuses, one must suspect, one Order. must suspect that she Order. has no faith. While she refuses, one must suspect that she has no faith in the Prime Minister's federalism Order. initiative. You may have no interest in the Prime Minister's federalism initiative because, Senator Faulkner, I don't know which side you're on in that particular that particular debate. The government should cease to put political. The government should cease to put political expediency beyond its requirement to comply with an order of the parliament. It should cease to put its political survival beyond that cornerstone of the constitution which is so important. In other words, Mr President, it should comply with the order, stop this nonsense, produce the tape and let the people of Australia make their own decision. Yeah. Senator Calder. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, the uh, Democrats will be supporting uh, this motion and supporting it very strongly. Um, the Mr. President, I, uh, I appreciate I appreciate the interjection from Senator Collins because uh, if he'd been in the chamber the other day, he would know that we rehearsed very adequately the reasons why this was not a private meeting. This indeed was very much a public meeting because it was a meeting between the minister and representatives representatives of peak councils who represent many tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of Australians. And it goes also very much to the uh, matter of whether it was a private meeting or not, that here we have the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister negotiating with the, uh, the state governments in relation to uh, the management of the Australian environment, and not the Minister for Environment, a very, very important uh, area of decision making. And uh, for those reasons, we believe that the public have a right to know that the public interest supervenes over any considerations that this was indeed a private meeting. We are particularly pleased to see that the, uh, the opposition's motion is aimed fairly and squarely at the government and not in this case at, uh, at uh, Minister Kelly. Um, we accept the, uh, the arguments which uh, uh, Senator Hill has just advanced in relation to, uh, to privilege and uh, the, uh, the clauses in his uh, motion which precede the uh, clause 5, uh, censuring the government for its unjustified failure to comply with the Senate resolution of the 10th of September. 
The letter before us, uh, Mr. President, uh, from uh, Senator Button is an incredibly, an incredibly arrogant letter. Uh, and I mean, clearly here he's, he's speaking on behalf of the government. He's, he's not just speaking uh, uh, as the leader of the Senate. He's speaking as a, as a very important uh, government representative and saying the government simply refuses an order of the Senate. And I, uh, I uh, repeat the, uh, the um, claim made by Senator Hill a few moments ago that this Senate, this Senate is composed of people directly elected by the people of Australia. We are a representative chamber. We are responsible directly back to the people of Australia. And here we have the, uh, the government which is not directly elected by the people of Australia, thumbing its nose at the directly elected chamber of the Senate and refusing to release the, uh, the tape recording. Now, if we turn to the, uh, to the words, and uh, Senator Hill has already uh, uh, reflected on these, if we turn to the words of the very partial transcript which has been released by the, um, by the government, the very partial transcript, there are, there are a tiny fragment out of what must have been a much, much longer uh, dialogue between the minister and those peak or representatives of those peak conservation bodies. It's quite clear that a, that a partial transcript can't give one a flavour of the, of the whole uh, dialogue which occurred uh, at that meeting. And moreover, it is also quite clear that depending on, upon where the emphasis is put in these words, the words are open to either the interpretation that uh, the state premiers and the state governments were indulging in crass politics, or indeed that the Prime Minister himself was engaging in, in crass politics and that the whole process <coughs> of new federalism was an exercise in crass politics. As the words say, and as they're uh, punctuated in the partial transcript which we have, um, they are that uh, basically from the Prime Minister is initiative with the state and it is really crass politics, comma. The clear reading of those words, in my view, is that uh, the, uh, the minister there was reflecting on the Prime Minister's moves in this area of new federalism. As uh, senators will know from the uh, debate yesterday, uh, the Democrats are particularly concerned about the substantive issue, the issue of, uh, of the protection of the Australian environment under this pattern of new federalism. And we learnt yesterday, almost certainly from uh, Senator Richardson's remarks, that here we have the government, the government moving into an area of uh, changing the management of the Australian environment and that that movement is being led by the Prime Minister and by the Prime Minister's officers. That Minister Kelly and the Department of Environment have no handle on that process at all. Now, surely, Mr President, that is an issue which is of vital concern to the Australian people. The Australian people have a right to know what is going on, how their environment is to be protected. As I indicated in my speech yesterday, all the recent uh, surveys of, of Australian public opinion indicate a very high level of concern by the Australian public uh, for uh, the better protection of the Australian environment. All those surveys indicate that uh, the, uh, the public want the federal government to uh, more comprehensively use its powers, powers which indeed it has used in the past, but it seems uh, from the uh, the, uh, the draft of the intergovernmental agreement, which we have uh, already, the fourth draft, that the federal government is moving to tie its own hands and to not, uh, not exercise those powers in the ways in which uh, both it and indeed the opposition have in the past. That is a matter of the public interest. That is a matter which should be rightly brought before this, uh, this Senate chamber. That is a matter on which the tape recording of the uh, meeting between Minister Kelly and the peak environment groups uh, is relevant. That is a matter which uh, goes really to the heart of um, the question of whether the, the government has a right to withhold that information 
from the properly elected Senate. And accordingly, uh, we very strongly support uh, this motion uh, put by the, uh, by the opposition. And uh, as we note in, the, in part six of the resolution calling upon the government to comply with the resolution of the Senate, we would repeat the arrogance, the arrogance of this government in not already complying uh, with the resolution of the Senate, the arrogance of, uh, of Minister Button in, uh, noting, in, in writing that very terse note to the Senate, simply refusing, not providing, as, as the motion before us says, not providing any substantive grounds whatsoever as to why uh, that tape should not be uh, should not be provided to to the Senate, and uh, again, as Senator Hill has said, even if those if grounds had been provided, it would be up to the Senate to determine whether those grounds were adequate and uh, and legal or not, and justifiable or not. But no grounds whatsoever have been provided in this very brief and terse note from uh, from Minister Button, and uh, accordingly, uh, we have. Uh, uh, very uh, great pleasure in supporting supporting this motion from the opposition. Senator Byrne. Mr. Uh, Deputy President, uh, I support uh, this motion and uh, congratulate Senator Coulter on uh, a, a most interesting and uh, uh, convincing contribution. I, uh, I must say I've disagreed with Senator Coulter many times in the past, and uh, I. Uh, I uh, agree totally with what he had to say today. I'd like to deal very briefly with some uh, very significant points. Firstly, it must be recognised that what appears to be an inconsequential matter, whether a tape recording uh, uh, says that uh, or reveals that Mrs. Kelly described, I'm sorry, uh, uh, the, the minister, uh, the Honourable Ros Kelly, uh, described. Uh, Mr Hawke's cooperative federalism as crass politics or not, uh, that uh, may not be regarded as a terribly serious matter, I suppose, by those people who are accustomed to ministers of this government uh, telling deliberate total falsehoods. There's nothing unusual about it. And I suppose some people are saying, well, why are we getting so excited about yet another deliberate lie from a government minister? Uh, I mean, the Prime Minister has admitted to, to lying, so uh, maybe there's not much uh, uh, significant, some people say, in this matter. But there is, because in the government's determination not to allow the truth to emerge, it has determined to confront the Senate, to deny the authority of an elected parliament. And this isn't the House of Representatives challenging the Senate. This is the executive government challenging the Senate. The executive government challenging the Senate. And so we have to ask. Why is it so significant? Why is Kellygate such, of such massive importance that the government is prepared to challenge the Senate? Now, the, uh, the uh, principle of, of privacy was raised, I think, by Senator Collins in, uh, in a quaint interjection, and it followed the nonsensical speech Senator Richardson made the other day on this topic. There is one vital matter that Senator Richardson and the government have to face up to, and that is the principle of privacy, which is a very important principle indeed, is totally breached, is totally breached if a private meeting is held and a party to that private meeting then misrepresents what happened at that meeting to the public. That breaches totally the principle of privacy. And that is what this minister did. She breached the principle of privacy, which she now seeks to hide behind, by telling total, complete untruths about what happened there. And the conservation movement has, uh, the, the conservationists who were there, have in a united way order. revealed the extent order. Order. to order. which she order. Order. misled the public about what happened at that meeting. Now, it wasn't just a question about the crass politics. It was a question about objections. It was on another ground. She breached, and there's been no denial by Mrs Kelly that what they have said now is absolutely right. 
that she breached the privacy of that meeting by telling untruths about the extent of opposition from the conservation movement to the, to the draft of that uh, proposal. The Prime Minister's proposal. Having breached it, she is now desperately trying to clothe herself with the, with the protection that she herself destroyed. So this nonsense that Senator Richardson has been going on about the sanctity of privacy is absolute and utter bunkum. It's all right, apparently, for the government for one of their ministers to have a meeting in private and then tell lies about the outcome and not, and not be prepared to put up with the other people uh, who were at that meeting say, no, that is not what happened at all. And so uh, that removes this phony issue of it being a private meeting totally out of the, uh, out of the discussion. What is absolutely central to this particular matter is that when, Mr. Hawke, when the Prime Minister uh, agreed to the small section, the 30 seconds out of three hours of transcript to be revealed, it was significant that the other people who were there have not come forward to say, oh, well, my memory must have been wrong. The, the government didn't produce uh, that in the Senate, uh, in the House of Representatives yesterday. People have not resiled, as I understand it, from their position. And uh, if that is so, it underlines the question one must ask about how real, how accurate, how correct that 30 seconds is in conveying what really happened in those three hours of meeting. That extract is capable of being interpreted as total support for what the conservationists are saying. It is capable of being interpreted in lots of ways. It is totally incoherent. If it's an expression of the minister's thinking, then God help the environmental, uh, uh, the environment in Australia, because it is full of sentences that begin somewhere vague and end somewhere even vaguer. But it is important uh, to note that Robert Ray, Senator Robert Ray, has demonstrated to us very strongly the day before yesterday why there is a huge difference between a transcript and a tape. He was even prepared to accuse me of lying when I inadvertently said someone from the Prime Minister's office had heard a little bit of, uh, of the tape, and, and when in fact they had read a bit of the transcript. Now, on our side, we assume those to be uh, uh, the same in terms of substance. There is no difference, theoretically, uh, no difference as far as we are concerned, in a transcript and a tape, because they are matters of substance that are the same. Senator Robert Ray doesn't think so, accused me of lying by saying a simple thing that he listened to the tape tape instead of the transcript. Oh, now, this clearly oh. indicates, as far as the Labor Party is concerned, there is a huge difference between a tape and a transcript, because transcripts can either be fiddled or a tiny extract, like 30 seconds, can be taken out, which distorts the meaning which would be evident if one uh, listened to the tape as a whole. Now, uh, well, uh, the Senator's interjection, Senator Macdonald's interjection, about something being deleted does raise questions about this Kellygate affair. I mean, to what extent are these Nixon-type tapes anyway? Why is the government not revealing them? Now, we've already seen that by allowing the transcript to come out, we've seen that there is stuff that is clearly offensive to uh, the state premiers, which clearly undermines, and deliberately so, the Prime Minister's relationships with the states, which is essential if his policy of cooperative federalism is to proceed. <coughs> Mrs Kelly's uh, uh, discussion uh, uh, about, uh, about the state premiers with the conservationists clearly does nothing to help the Prime Minister's relationship with them on this sensitive issue. It is aimed at undermining the Prime Minister's relationship with the premiers. And you can see that from the response of the state premiers. The emperor strikes back, said Mr Griner. Labor premiers are refusing to uh, give uh, 
a response to it because they're not going to, uh, to credit it as something worthy of a response. Now, uh, if, uh, if it is not to be revealed, the full tape is not to be revealed, how many other insults, I wonder, are in that tape? I wonder how many expletives have been deleted. I wonder how Nixonian Kelly Gate really is. And uh, in the end, I should uh, let uh, the government know that uh, the Nixon tapes eventually did undo Senator Nixon, uh, Mr. Nixon, President Nixon. I wonder uh, how undone Mrs. Kelly will be when this tape eventually emerges. Now, there is no doubt from the tape that uh, Mrs. Kelly's views of Mr. Hawke's uh, co uh, cooperative federalism are clearly antagonistic, that uh, no matter how you interpret this comment, uh, and I quote from the, from the transcript, the first draft let me tell you about the intergovernmental agreement as you know, has emerged basically from the Prime Minister's initiative with the states, and it's really crass politics at the lowest common denominator, full stop. Now, this politics, this situation that has been created, has been created by the Prime Minister. This one which uh, stems, has emerged basically from the Prime Minister's initiative. It's really crass politics. In other words, the system that the Prime Minister has developed, which she now says, oh, I only meant that they would misuse it. This system, even if you take her interpretation of this messy bit of uh, uh, semantics, if you take her in, uh, interpretation of it, she is saying that the Prime Minister has been foolish enough to create a hopeless situation in which the Premiers can play crass politics at the expense of the environment. And that's if you take her interpretation. And that is undermining the Prime Minister, as uh, Senator Hill says. Either way, she has set out, and it is now evident, to undermine the Prime Minister uh, the, and the Prime Minister's policy in relation to the environment. And, and by way of conclusion, uh, Mr Deputy President, this impression is reinforced today by the latest Kellygate bit, where a representative of Greenpeace says Mrs Kelly had told meetings he had attended that new federalism contradicted strong environmental policy. She can, I quote, she considers that new federalism and environment protection are contradictory. And he said it is very clear from the meetings he has attended. This has been a consistent pattern of undermining by Mrs Kelly. She has, as Senator Hill says, consistently rejected the Prime Minister. She regards her policies as in conflict with the Prime Minister's. She is part of the campaign to destroy the Prime Minister, and she is using the environment as yet another of the weapons in that campaign to get rid of the Prime Minister and replace him with Mr Keating. Now, quite frankly, she can use in her internal battles what methods she likes. When those methods come out into the public arena, when they cause concern and, in fact, uh, uh, upset a, a large proportion of the, a large part of the population, when they create, date, create doubt in the minds of people what the government's policy really is, is it the Kelly policy or is it the Hawke policy? then the parliament has a right to know, the people have a right to know what really happened at that expletive deleted meeting. And uh, it is a disgrace that this government is prepared to protect this minister because of these internal dissensions, because of the, uh, because of the, the need to make certain that the waters remain as unruffled as possible. Because if the prime minister did what he should do, and sack this minister, there would be repercussions in terms of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the battle for the leadership. There is no basis of principle on which this government is keeping this secret. 
the government does have something to hide, it must reveal it. The Honourable Minister, Senator Richardson. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Mr Deputy President. I uh, have listened with uh, some interest to the contributions this morning because I I've been trying to work out what, uh, what prompts this, uh, this performance. I suspect, having listened to the last couple of, uh, of contributions, that uh, it's not really so difficult to work out. Yesterday there were some significant events. The first, I think, was the House of Representatives refusing a motion of Senator Cheney's to release the tape, so that uh, the uh, House of Representatives took a position directly contrary to, uh, to the Senate. And that's, uh, no, I simply state a fact. The House of Representatives rejected a resolution to produce the tape. And uh, that, uh, I'm not trying to kid anybody, that happened. That's on the record. But you don't believe that. I, uh, I feel sorry for you, Senator, but then again, I often have. But if one goes past that, I think there was something. There were two other events, really, that were much more important yesterday than that. Much more important that prompts the opposition into action. The first was question time, and every report of question time suggests that Mr. Hewson, or Dr. Hewson, and Mr. Cheney were uh, very much the losers. They did very poorly. Very poorly. The press gallery sat there and looked at it, but the press gallery did something that the Liberals really couldn't forgive, really couldn't forgive. What the press gallery did was then ask some questions of Mr Cheney. They asked some questions of Mr Cheney, and the reaction to that suggests that yesterday was probably the low point of Mr Cheney's career, the low point. And all the momentum that the opposition were allegedly building up all disappeared yesterday. They did very badly indeed. So here they are today, trying to concoct a crisis. Well, sadly for them, Mr Deputy President, there just isn't one, and uh, no number of speeches can create it. First off, we, uh, we should, uh, I think, deal with legalities. We are not here dealing with a question of constitutional law. Merely a question. <laughs> you are dumb. Merely, merely a question, Mr. Deputy President, of constitutional practice, uh, where we have uh, the Senate demanding the release of a tape by uh, a person in another place, and uh, we have the House of Representatives refusing to pass the same resolution. Now, I'd like to quote Mr Deputy President from Erskine and May, More than what your numbers are and uh, I think the quote, uh, the quote uh, is pretty clear. It says, the leading principle, which appears to pervade all the proceedings between the Houses of Parliament, is that there shall subsist a perfect equality between them and that they shall be, in every respect, totally independent one of the other. And here comes the crux of it. Or, or, order. Hence it or, is. Or, or, order. order. The uh, speakers from the opposition were heard in relative silence. Not, I, in, in, in order, order, in relative silence. <laughs> Senator Boehm, Senator Boehm, you will come to order, and if you want, want to be insolent, I will deal with you. The members on the my left were heard in relative silence, not in silence, in relative silence. I would ask the same to be the case for the minister. <laughs> Senator, are you rising on a point. Going to point of order? Yes, the point of order, Mr. Deputy President, relates to the, uh, the uh, requirement uh, uh, of the chair uh, to deal, as I understood it, impartially with the proceedings of the chamber. Uh, my my uh, point is that you, Mr. Deputy President, had to call for order consistently, uh, particularly Senator Faulkner, during my, uh, my speech. 
uh, that as a result of that, in fact, some order did descend later in the speech, but that for the bulk of the time, I was subjected to, in fact, non-stop interjection. And so I ask you to review uh, the, the comments you just made. I indicated when I spoke that, uh, that members on, of the opposition were heard in, uh, with relative silence. I, I, I call the minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. As I was saying, uh, I was coming to the crux of this quote from Erskine and May. Hence it is that neither House can claim, much less exercise, any authority over a member of the other. And so, uh, while uh, the Senate can pass uh, censure motions against the government, can pass demands that Mrs Kelly produce the tape, there is in fact no way that the Senate can enforce that, um, th those resolutions. And so what we are indulging in here is not an issue of constitutional law, not an issue of constitutional practice, but rather, to quote a phrase oft heard in the last few days, an exercise in crass politics, the crassest of politics. Now, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, uh, to quote from the editorial in today's Financial Review. Now, one wouldn't refer to the Financial Review normally as a, as a socialist drag. One, one wouldn't call it a, uh, a, uh, a, a mouthpiece of, uh, of the Labor Party, but it does have in its editorial, I think uh, some interesting points. And I quote, but by blunting and repelling the opposition's main attack, <coughs> the government has placed itself in a position to turn the attack back and to argue that the opposition has indulged in a trivial and time-wasting pursuit. To concentrate, as the opposition has over the past week, on what has turned out to be a bit of colourful language by one politician is plain silly. Now that, I think, uh, sums up this issue, uh, Mr President. I think uh, the uh, citizens of Australia must regard this as one of the great yawns of our time. The great yawns of our time. I am particularly disappointed in, uh, in Senator Coulter's contribution. I'm disappointed in it because uh, Senator Coulter appears to have taken a, uh, a position on whether or not this meeting is private, which runs contrary to almost every person who has attended that meeting or the other meetings of the uh, uh, peak councils during the course of the last four years. As, uh, as the minister who presided over them for, for uh, three years, I can assure Senator Coulter, the Senate and anyone else who may be listening, if they're unfortunate enough to happen to be doing so, that um, those meetings have always been private. They were structured in that way in the first place. And uh, Mrs. Kelly did not make them public. And uh, the difficulty that, uh, that Senator Calder faces, and all opposition senators face in this, is that there is no question, not only that they've been private in the past, but that uh, they remain so. And if we wanted to look for some sources of this, then I think uh, they're not too hard to find. First, I, uh, I quote from Don Henry, the director of the World wide fund for nature, where he says that uh, that fund believes that the privacy of peak conservation group meetings should be respected. It has been our understanding in the past that no formal transcript of the meeting has been made, rather that a listing of action points from the meeting is developed. So we have no doubt where the World Wide Fund for Nature stands on the question. Then if one looks at uh, the Australian Council of National Trusts, we have a letter signed by Duncan Marshall of that uh, organisation and of Harry Barber from the Conservation Council of Victoria. The Australian Council of National Trusts and the Conservation Council of Victoria write to support a call for all parties to respect the privacy of peak conservation group meetings. The above groups are participants in peak meetings. These meetings occur regularly and involve discussions with ministers, shadow ministers and other parliamentarians. I'd be, I'd be surprised if even 
if even someone like Senator Campbell thought the National Trust were not worthy of support. Then again, uh, he may. And if he has that view, I'm quite happy for him to express it. Quite happy for him to. Oh, he's gone silent. Isn't that a shock and a surprise? Isn't that a shock and a surprise? And of course, a, uh, a, uh, there's further correspondence here from uh, the Australian Conservation Foundation, in which uh, Philip Toyne expresses, expresses his strong support for the continuation of those meetings to be conducted on a private and confidential basis—a private and confidential basis. But it doesn't end there. Senator Coulter, you really have placed yourself at odds with the conservation movement on this question. I want to quote from uh, Rosie Crisp, the coordinator of the Queensland Conservation Council, who was, of course, a participant in the order, meeting. Order, order, Senator who Campbell. Was, of course, order. a participant in the meeting. Well, obviously, the meeting that was held with the minister and conservationists was a private meeting. Obviously, it was a private meeting. These are regular meetings that are held with the minister, and the discussion is very open and honest and frank. And it is a private discussion. So there isn't simply one or two people saying this. There is a, uh, a whole raft of people saying that it's a private meeting. And as the, the person who convened them for three years, I can assure all honourable senators that was always the case. It was uh, very effective. I'm glad you said that, uh, Senator Faulkner. But I think the, the important thing was that in uh, my time as minister, there was only one leak from them, and uh, the person responsible, who was from the Wilderness Society, got uh, as big a serve off the rest of the conservation movement as he got off me, and, uh, and it didn't happen again. So that the, the privacy of those meetings was respected for all of those three years. Now, uh, apparently, uh, in this uh, exercise, as I said, Mr Deputy President of Crass Politics, there's a suggestion that um, Mrs Kelly has in some way—I can't quite understand the way myself—but has in some way uh, attacked the Prime Minister. Well, if one reads the, uh, the press this morning, there can't be any doubt in, uh, in their minds that uh, the extract from, uh, uh, from the tape uh, does suggest that uh, she didn't attack the Prime Minister but did attack the Premier. In fact, uh, various newspapers quote the Premier's reaction to uh, Mrs Kelly's words. The Premiers, uh, from uh, Mr Bannon and Mr Griner, weren't, uh, weren't in any doubt about who got criticised and uh, have uh, have responded uh, as one might expect uh, them to respond if they have been criticised. In fact, uh, if one looks at uh, the words of, uh, of Rodney Faulkner on AM, the 11th of this week, uh, no, I, <coughs> no, no, no relation, um, and I'm sure not spoken to by uh, by uh, the Senator. Oh, you're not such a bad fellow. Uh, I want to quote what he had to say. Um, if, if we are talking about the Prime Minister uh, being attacked by Mrs Kelly, if this really is some sort of terrible plot which, uh, which the government is, uh, is uh, purporting to uh, protect, then uh, I think Rodney Faulkner's uh, words are instructive. I believe that she was quite strongly on that particular issue, which is the whole uh, of the federalism proposals, took an official line, if you like, a prime ministerial line on some issues. She sympathised with us. On others, she disagreed. In fact, uh, she said, uh, I should say, he said, we weren't pleased with the federal line as a whole, as represented by Mrs. Kelly. The point being that uh, Mrs. Kelly's performance at uh, at the meeting of uh, the Peak uh, Council, of the conservation groups, had been to support. Of course, I haven't heard the tape, and and I have. No intention, no intention whatsoever of trying to. Why would I want to hear the tape? Why would I want to hear the tape? The tape is of a private meeting. And if good government is to continue, if there is to be any any hope for the effectiveness of that uh, of that uh, government uh, uh, kind of meeting to continue, then there has to be some respecting of the privacy of it. And uh, meetings which have four years. Okay, come on, Madge. Point of order. I beg your pardon. Come on, did you, I beg your pardon. Did you have a, did you have a point Mr. of order, Mr. Deputy President? Uh, if uh, the minister thinks he's being amusing by being insulting, I would ask him to withdraw that remark. 
Indeed, well, in my view, you have. I'd, uh, order, I didn't, I didn't hear a. Was, uh, he I was didn't making hear a disparaging co uh, um, comment in calling me a name that is not my name. I would ask him to withdraw it. Is that, is that what your point of order was? No. I would ask him to recall that. I seek your guidance, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. I, I, Mr. Deputy President, I, uh, if I have uh, in any way uh, made an unparliamentary remark, or uh, then obviously I would uh, I would withdraw. Um, but uh, there is a, uh, a reference, I think, in the Sydney Morning Herald to uh, to a uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, Senator Bishop, in which. Um, in which uh, actually Senator Collins last night, uh, the man no, described uh, here uh, as having uh, a waist uh, as big uh, as order, order, do, order Senator Richardson. Call, call, order, order, order Senator Richardson. Yeah. I, th I think it might not be uh, wise to compound anything that's occurred. Um, I heard a remark, and um, I'm not quite sure that I regarded this as unparliamentary. I didn't know where it came from. Uh, it came, certainly came from my right. If um, Senator Bishop finds the word unparliamentary, I would ask, to ask for it to be withdrawn. I think that's the easiest. I shall withdraw it then. Cool. Now, you had a point of order, Senator Bishop. Yes, I did have a point of order, Mr Deputy President. My point of order related to the fact that we are debating a specific motion relating to the uh, tape which is, uh, the Senate has, requested, uh, has ordered be t uh, produced and tabled. The minister has now admitted that he has not heard the tape and he is attempting to defend uh, a tape which he is uh, no longer uh, finding relevant, no longer finding relevant in his address, and I would ask him to address the subject matter of the motion, or else to cease and stop uh, and uh, cease his uh, contribution to the debate. Well, I can't see any point of order. Um, I think that on a matter such as censure of the government, it's uh, quite. Uh, quite in order for the minister to range fairly widely, and as a matter of fact, I don't, I'm not sure that he has been ra ranging too widely. Uh, I know I'd like to call point the minister. Point of, uh, point of order. I, uh, uh, there's been a recent case of mistaken identity, uh, uh, Mr. President. I also, or I certainly did, uh, interject a moment ago and uh, referred to Senator Bishop as Madge, and in the same spirit as Senator Senator Richardson, I withdraw that. Yeah, I, I, I thought that might have been the case. I think, uh, Senator Richards. Uh, Mr. Deputy President, the whole point that, uh, that I've sought to make is that it's a private meeting and therefore the tape shouldn't be released. The fact that it's a private meeting means why would I want to listen to the tape? I mean, if it's indeed private, and uh, there can be no question on the basis of all of the comments of the participants, bar one, and I'll get to that in a moment, bar one, that uh, it's a private meeting. If, if all the participants say so, it's quite extraordinary that uh, here in the Senate there seem to be a whole lot of people with a, with a different view. None of them have been ever participants at these meetings, nor ever will be. None of them can therefore comment on... Well, not, not in the last four years. Not in the last four years. Not in the last four years. And, uh, well, I, I'm quite prepared to say that Senator Coulter has attended some. What I am certain of is that there is no one in the opposition, no one who could ever go near a conservation group, let alone get elected to a position where they finish up at a peak council meeting. No one over there would ever get the environment movement to, uh, to go near them, to talk to them or anything else. You, Senator McDonald, you are the one that uh, Queensland conservation groups are concentrating on for your appalling attitude to the environment. But uh, to get back to the point, because I, uh, I don't, I mean, it is only the objections against me to range from the point, Mr. Deputy President. And uh, well, I, uh, I tell you what, I'd love to have a contest. Um, I think uh, it's clear from all of those uh, quotes that I've read out that uh, the two things emerge from uh, th that meeting: a, all of its participants, except for one person, regard the meeting as private. All of them. Secondly. Uh, all of them, bar one again, bar one again, are, uh, are making it very clear uh, that uh, Mrs Kelly took the line which the Prime Minister has been taking on new federalism, and it is the fact that she took that line, the fact that she wouldn't depart from that line, which the conservationists obviously don't like, 
that uh, caused so much uh, uh, anger and indeed uh, the leaks that uh, finally came from that meeting. But even, uh, even all of those people don't wish the, uh, the tape to be produced. In fact, the only person who's come out and said that um, this was not a private meeting was Mr Gilding from Greenpeace, and I note with interest that Senator Bone quoted from him this morning. <clears throat> now, I, I hadn't realised that Greenpeace was going to become the, uh, the or, or statements by Greenpeace would become as a, uh, as a gospel for, uh, uh, for the opposition. But I'd have to say that, uh, that uh, Mr Gilding's comments put him at absolute odds with uh, the rest of the participants at that meeting. And so uh, you can take a view, I suppose. Does one out of a dozen equal a majority? I think uh, most people over here would say no. Does not make him and, uh, wrong. I, uh, well, I, I think that the word of the other 11 doesn't make them wrong either, Senator no, Crane. Does doesn't make them does wrong either. Wrong. There are just so many who can uh, overrule his view that uh, the weight of evidence is so strongly against him you couldn't go any other way. I hope you're never sitting on a jury. And so I um, I'd have thought, uh, Mr Deputy President, that given, uh, given the word of all of, those, uh, of all of those people who've attended the meeting, given the history of those meetings as always having been private, then uh, one wonders how we get to, to the stage we're at this morning. We get there for only one reason. The opposition had a very bad day yesterday. Very bad day yesterday. They, they, were, they were given a dreadful time by the gallery. And I don't blame Senator Jockey Jock Peterson for yawning. I would too. I said it was one of the great yawns of our time. They got a very bad time yesterday. Did very poorly indeed. And so uh, today we see uh, what, Senator what amounts Faulkner, to no you're not being more. helpful to the chair. What amounts to no more than a, uh, a stunt, a stunt all about crass politics, nothing about constitutions, nothing about law, only about politics. And uh, at the end of the day, I think the Australian people would be entitled to wonder why, why the Senate would waste its time on a motion like this. Why uh, all of us would have to sit here and go through this when the reality is that there's no power to enforce this resolution, none whatsoever. No power to enforce this resolution. And the only thing that can be achieved here is yet another debate about whether the tape of a private meeting should be produced when the participants at the meeting bar one all say it shouldn't. And I wonder why it is that the Democrats would want to lend themselves to the crass politics in this motion. Senator Roche. Mr uh, Deputy President, Senator Richardson has just concluded his speech by saying that this Senate has no power to compel the production of the tapes in question. Senator Richardson began his speech by saying that this was a debate not about constitutional law but about constitutional practice. That may well be the case, Mr Deputy President, but this is a debate about a constitutional practice that is honoured by this government more in the breach than in the observance. And Senator Richardson knows full well that this Senate does have the power to compel the production of these tapes, that the resolution of the Senate passed on Tuesday is a binding resolution, and Senator Richardson full well knows that the refusal of this government to comply with the resolution of the Senate amounts to almost a contempt of this chamber and of the institution of representative government. For Senator Richardson's benefit, perhaps we might start with the ludicrous argument that this was a private meeting. Is it appropriate that the tape of a meeting should be brought into the public domain is the question that Senator Richardson asked, not just on Tuesday but also now. Yeah, keep flapping your wings, Senator West, you might fly away as well. Yeah, you might fly away and find yourself sitting next to the tooth fairy, Senator West. Perhaps it might not be ordinarily appropriate for a tape of a private meeting to be brought into the public domain, but let's not forget this one fact, that the matter in question is already in the public domain. How can anybody honestly say that this was a private meeting when the contents of the meeting, the matter in question, 
has been spread throughout the newspapers, over radio and television. And this government has the audacity to come before the Senate and say, but it's still a private meeting. Well, for Senator Richardson's benefit, I'm going to quote from The Australian. Because Senator Richardson obviously didn't get around to reading The Australian today. And this is what Glenn Milne had to say, referring to, to uh, Minister Kelly's refusal to make the tape available on the grounds that it was a private meeting. He said, and I quote, her refusal for not doing so amounted to a legal fiction. Kelly claimed the meeting was private and should remain so. This was a meeting the contents of which had already been published on the front page of The Weekend on Australian, an account that included confirmation by three Green representatives present at the September 4 meeting. It was a meeting that Kelly discussed with the Prime Minister the same morning when he interrupted his racing tips to call her from Sydney's Ramada Renaissance Hotel to check what she'd actually said. So much for the argument that it was a private meeting. The matter is in the public domain and it is therefore important if we are to have any confidence in this minister. It is important if we are to have any confidence in this government. It is important if we are to have any confidence in the honour and integrity of the executive that the whole of the tape be produced, because the questions that now arise go right to the heart of Minister Kelly's ability to discharge her duties as a member of the executive government. Now, of course, yesterday Senator Richardson also tried the line, and it was contradictory to his first argument, that we could get the tapes under the Freedom of Information Act. Of course, this Senate, in passing the Freedom of Information Act, never intended to abrogate its powers under standing orders to an item of legislation. The Freedom of Information Act was always supplementary to the powers of this Senate that have remained and remain to this day. And Senator Richardson, in raising that foolish freedom of information argument on Tuesday, showed what a poor grasp of the actual facts he really does have. As Senator Hill has said, there are some 20, 20, precedents, 20 precedents of motions calling on the government to table documents. And these are, perhaps, instructive for Senator Richardson and his colleagues on the other side of the chamber. For example, on the 19th of March 1931, a resolution that was passed requiring the production of all papers in connection with an increase of duty on Oregon, and in particular letters from the Secretary to the Executive of the South Australian branch of the Labor Party, addressed respectively to the acting Prime Minister and to the Prime Minister, to be laid upon the table of the Library. It clearly shows that this Labor Party that occupies the government benches is trying an old stunt. They're trying to do what they've tried to do before, but at least the Labor Party of 1931 had a sense of integrity, had a sense of decency, and knew that they had to comply with an order of the Senate when it was made. This Labor Party, this pathetic, this pathetic excuse for what once may have been a great party, doesn't have the integrity, doesn't have the honesty, doesn't have the courage to comply with an order of the Senate. And they treat this Senate with contempt, and for that they should be condemned, and that is why we are moving this censure motion against them today. Now, of course, Senator Richardson, <laughs> Senator Richardson might also be interested might also be interested in when the Labor Party, when they occupied the opposition benches, asked for the production of the papers. And that was in 1982. And Senator Richardson perhaps may be enlightened to know that his colleague, now the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Senator Evans, had no difficulties with requiring the production of highly confidential documents, documents that are much more confidential than these, because they were documents that related to legal advices on pending court cases. And yet this government refuses to make available a tape of a meeting the contents of which are already public upon the ludicrous argument that the meeting was private. Senator Richardson clearly doesn't know what he's talking about. But Senator Richardson too came into this chamber and selectively quoted from Erskine May. And Senator Richardson said that there was an equality between 
both houses of parliament and neither yes and neither house could com could exercise authority over a member of the other house well, Erskine may may well say that but did senator richardson tell us what Erskine may said on page 433 no he didn't for senator richardson's uh, information i'm going to quote to him what it says Similarly, it has been accepted that a document which has been cited by a minister, and goodness knows how many times this particular document has been cited, ought to be laid on the table of the House if it can be done without injury to the public interest. I submit, Mr Deputy President, that the production of this tape is not only not contrary to the public interest, but is directly in promotion of the public interest so that we can see the disgraceful and shameful way in which this government conducts itself. And of course, Senator Richardson, in trying this spurious argument that the Senate could not order the government to produce a document, overlooks the fact that in 1982 his good friend and colleague Senator Evans in fact moved a motion calling upon Senator Cheney as minister representing the Attorney-General to table documents here in the Senate. Senator Richardson can't even go back and get it right compared with his mate Senator Evans in 1982. There's a difference too between a member of the House of Representatives and this government. And what this Senate is doing is calling upon the government to comply with an order of the Senate. Senator Richardson can't get away with his ludicrous argument that there is some sort of executive privilege. The fact is, the only privilege that this government can claim is a privilege of its own arrogance. The privilege of its own arrogance in believing that it's not accountable to the people. The fact is, there is a very clear case on what is and is not executive privilege, which was decided by the High Court of Australia in 1978, which is Sankey and Whitlam, in which it was ruled, in which it, indeed a very famous case, another honourable, an honourable Labor minister, an honourable Labor prime minister, in which the High Court ruled, in which the High Court ruled, well, well, Mr. Whitlam did have principles, and if he didn't like them, he found others. <laughs> it was ruled in 1978. The documents or portions thereof were not privileged from production unless, of course, that it would harm the public uh, interest by the disclosure of those documents. What harm can be done to the public interest by finding out whether or not Mrs Kelly is a Minister of Integrity? I would have thought if Mrs Kelly was a Minister of Integrity, it would go to the public interest to table the documents. But this government doesn't think so. I think the final word on the matter, Mr Deputy President, the final word on the matter is a uh, an answer, a statement given by, by the President of the Senate on the, 14th of, uh, on the 22nd of November 1978, in which he said in relation to the production of documents and the question of executive privilege, he said, and I quote, I go no further than to express the view that the Senate would no doubt uh, take uh, the recent decision of the High Court judgment into consideration in, in, uh, in these matters. The President also said, uh, Mr Deputy President, and I quote, replying generally, the questions involve matters which are ultimately for the Senate to decide in the regulations of its own proceedings. It is appropriate for the Senate to decide these matters. It is within the power of the Senate to decide these matters. It is within the power of the Senate to order this disgraceful, dishonest and disgusting government to comply with the principles of representative government to comply with the principles of parliamentary duty and to table the tapes that this Senate and the people of Australia demand to know. Senator Cooney. Deputy President, this, this motion, this, this motion uh, is a motion that's to be expected. And uh, what it does show, what it, what it does show about the constitutionality of the uh, of the system under which we uh, operate, under the Westminster system, what it does show about it is it's a party system. And uh, the fact that it is a party system will soon be illustrated. Because uh, when the vote comes to be taken on this, uh, on this matter, uh, there will be not a single person, I hope, from this side of the uh, chamber who will do anything but vote against it. And I hope that everybody over there is loyal enough to their party.
to vote with their party. And I would be disappointed if, uh, uh, on an uh, issue of party politics such as this is, that people wouldn't stand by the party uh, on the, uh, under whose banner they have arrived in this chamber. Well, now, uh, I, well, now look, all I'm saying is this, that that, I mean, that's to be, so, and there's no doubt that the reason that over in the other place uh, a motion like this uh, would be defeated is because over there the government, the Australian Labor Party, has the numbers, as Senator Walters says, and that's absolutely correct. So I think that it's, it's, it's important, first of all, to understand what this is all about. Now, I don't mean to say by that. Now, I don't mean to say, but well, it is a constitutional point, uh, Senator uh, Alster, because as you know, uh, uh, it's constitutionally the position that whatever party wins the greatest number in the, uh, in the House of Representatives governs. And no doubt that you've got every ambition in the world, and properly so, uh, <coughs> that, uh, that well, it's proper to have an ambition like that, that you will be a, uh, a minister after the next, uh, uh, on the front bench after the next election. And I would hope and I would expect that, in, that those behind you stay solidly behind you and support you if you get into any, uh, any difficulty. Now, I mean, that's, let, let's, so that, all I'm saying is that's the reality of this situation. Now, now on the other hand, uh, well, we're all putting party ahead of the, uh, in that certain circumstances, if that's how you put it, everybody puts uh, their... Uh, uh, well, I, 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 look, I, I better get on, but just to answer Senator Hill, uh, he says you put party ahead of principle. All I'm saying, as a matter of reality, in this chamber and in the other one, that is how this system under which we uh, now live operates. And, uh, order, order, well, order. Right. Well, look, we'll, we'll order. talk about that later on. But the next thing I want to say is this. I think, in spite of all that, that, that the reality of things, being as they are, nevertheless, it is, uh, it is the situation that uh, this uh, House this uh, Senate has passed this motion and made an order which must be, I say, must be treated very seriously indeed. And the fact of the matter is that the tapes have not been uh, uh, laid on the table. Now, <coughs> there's no uh, doubt in my mind that uh, it's uh, proper for a uh, Senate and for a House of Representatives to make uh, orders for productions of tapes in certain circumstances. But what everybody has agreed upon is that the public interest is a uh, significant point in deciding whether or not uh, uh, a uh, particular tape or a particular piece of uh, evidence should be produced. And that there is no doubt that this chamber makes decisions on the basis of what's in the public interest. And can I illustrate, can I illustrate where this chamber in very recent times has decided that it would be wrong? It would be wrong for people to reveal what went on in a meeting, and indeed, uh, as a result of a particular meeting, that uh, the contents of which were revealed in this chamber, we now have in our committee room a, uh, a, a system whereby uh, the word "isolated" appears uh, when uh, the uh, the recording equipment is uh, is on or when it's off, and that arose because Senator Schott some time ago, revealed the uh, contents of a meeting to deal with people who are interested in preserving life uh, at a, uh, an early stage of its existence and where they were having a meeting, which I would have thought was a public meeting in the sense that people from all parties were there, and uh, where that uh, meeting uh, was in fact uh, broadcast over the broadcasting system. And even though it had been uh, broadcast, uh, people and in my view, properly, took exception to the fact that we revealed in this, um, in this chamber. Now, it seems to me to be uh, 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 an issue as to whether or not matters ought to be revealed, when in one case, this chamber, and on that case it was the other side who was saying it shouldn't have been revealed, and where uh, Chris Schott, a man of some uh, tender emotions, may I say, a person very easily hurt, was subject to some criticism, which I don't think he's ever quite recovered from, that uh, on that occasion, uh, well, Senator Heron, you weren't here then, but people quite properly, and I think 
Senator Bjelke Peterson was at that meeting, and I thought she was quite right in the, uh, in, in the approach that she took to say that that sort of thing should not have been revealed to the public without people being told about it. Now that was a very and you see, can I just go on to a point here? I don't think in a certain sense it matters whether this was a public meeting or a private meeting, because what the significant thing is that that tape that Senator uh, that uh, Mrs Kelly took was a tape for her own purpose. And uh, that was a confidential tape. Now, I don't think it matters very much whether there's a, uh, a public meeting or a private meeting in question here. What does matter is whether or not what she did was to take that down on tape in a confidential manner. Well, it was for her purposes. Nobody's, 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 uh, nobody's, uh, uh, nobody's talking about that. Now, <coughs> look, if we take this principle too far, this is what we should do. Look, let's make everything open. So everybody on the uh, last day of sitting, of each of our sittings, have got to bring in their private diaries about what's happened in this uh, chamber, what's happened in their uh, party meeting. What's... All right. Well, what about... So, so the distinction made by Senator Hill is that the members of parliament have got... Uh, the members of parliament have got uh, a confidentiality. They've got the right to confidentiality, but ministers haven't got the right to confidentiality. Well, look, Senator, uh, Senator Hill, that, uh, that concerns me uh, uh, considerably. That you say, as long as there's a, a formality which will be defined by a, uh, a group of uh, by half the Senate or more than half the Senate, uh, then, uh, uh, then whatever goes on in that uh, should be made uh, it should be made public. But, uh, and I, look. There would have been diaries made, no doubt, by the people who were there, and uh, I think it would be wrong. It would be wrong for this Senate or for this Parliament to compel people who had gone to private meetings or public meetings to uh, to uh, to put forward their diaries, any other notes they'd made about a meeting that had taken place. Now that, that gets us to an uh, to an absurd situation, because all of us all of us keep our uh, <laughs> the thoughts in our head. Now, uh, that's what you'll be after next, by the way. You'll be saying, look, what we really want to know is your real thoughts. And can I just follow that through and see where we get to on that? Because what I'm saying is this. <laughs> there is a public statement by, uh, by Mrs Kelly as to what happened there. There's a public statement by uh, the others as to what happened. But you say, you say, look, that's not sufficient. What we want to do Mrs Kelly, is to get this information so we can cross-examine you, so we can say that what you say publicly, what you say publicly is not correct. That's almost getting down to uh, being thought police, because what you're doing, no, you're not saying, look, the important thing, the important thing as far as government is concerned, the important thing as far as government is concerned is what ministers say publicly. <coughs> what they say publicly is what the government's position is. Now, uh, if, if you keep interrupting, certainly, uh, Senator Macdonald. And uh, if, if, uh, <laughs> well, right. And um, it's 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 wrong, clearly wrong in principle, that uh, people should be able, or Senate, whether it's the Senate or the House of Representatives, should be able to go on a uh, fishing expedition to find out material that they may be able to use to embarrass uh, the government or any particular minister uh, when that minister has acted correctly and properly. And let's get this clear. Uh, Mrs Kelly, uh, in her public statements, has acted uh, quite correctly, quite, uh, with, with, with complete integrity. There is nothing in her public utterances, nothing in her public utterances that that, that, could, uh, that, could be, uh, that could be condemned. And if I can, and, and if I can take that remark, now let's, let's, if I can I take that remark from one of the most outstanding intellects on the, uh, on the opposition bench, that's Senator Kemp, if I can take that remark, it shows you what this is all about. It shows you what this is all about because what Senator Kemp is saying, and he reveals the position of the other side, is they want to use this to embarrass the government over the leadership struggle. Now, this is not—let's be clear about this—this this is not 
from the remark that's come over the other side. This is not, uh, 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 Madam Acting Deputy uh, President, uh, an attempt to get to the truth of some matter that's of a vital public interest. This is an attempt to fish and muck tape to see if they can find something that can be used to embarrass the, uh, uh, the government over the leadership position. Nothing to do with environment, nothing to do with, uh, with any uh, portfolio that the government has to have. The, Senator, the, the comment from Senator Kemp clearly illustrates that what this is all about is the uh, attempt to embarrass this government over the leadership struggle by getting to somebody's private papers. Of course they are. But uh, that's what it's all about. So that when you're looking at public interest, when you say that the public interest is at stake, you haven't been able to produce any evidence as to uh, what public interest you have in mind. And the, uh, the, the next thing is this. I think that if there is material available, whether it's confidential, whether it's taking a private meeting or a public meeting, which is in the public interest to reveal, then it's proper for um, Parliament to do something about it. But you simply can't go fishing. It's unfair by the uh, very nature of the process on witnesses, unfair on the very nature, by the very nature of the process on ministers, simply to go fishing amongst their confidential material in the hope that you'll find something to uh, embarrass a government with. So if you're going to proclaim the public interest, you've got to produce some evidence, some evidence that on this tape there is something that goes to the, uh, to the issue of how this government's governing. And, uh, but you see, Senator Kemp, again you illustrate exactly what I'm saying. What you say, look, give us a transcript and we'll tell you what's in the public interest. What I'm saying is you've got to point to something that suggests it's in the public interest and then ask for it. You simply can't go fishing, because if you go fishing, we might as well get everybody's uh, diary, everybody's uh, tape and simply come in here. And that's what the alarming thing is about this. There's no, there's no evidence at all that you can produce, no evidence that you can produce to show that this tape goes to the public interest. And the, and the best evidence I have to illustrate that is that famous figure, Senator Kemp, as I say, one of the great intellects on that side of the chamber, the best, the best perhaps, the best mind, one of the best minds over there, may I say, and the best, yes, one of the best minds, including you, Senator Stewart, the best he says he can say on behalf of the opposition is, look, give us the tape and then we'll tell you where the public interest is. Now, what I'm saying, and you'll be, you'll be coming up after me, uh, Senator, uh, uh, Senator Olson, I want to hear you on this. Uh, where do you disagree with the uh, position Senator Kemp puts that what this is all about is a fishing expedition to find some material in which to put against uh, uh, Mrs Kelly? If you had some evidence that Mrs Kelly in some way had not done her duty, if you had some evidence that in some way she would uh, departed from her ministerial responsibilities, then we could look at things, but you can't. The uh, other thing I want to say is people have quoted, people, uh, I'll sit down, people have quoted, and I agree, and uh, Hodges in his sixth, the, uh, the sixth edition of the Australian Senate practice says this, and I, uh, I uh, say it, <coughs> Uh, that he says uh, the sixth edition contends that the executive government enjoys no privilege which puts it above parliament. And I agree, having in mind that an overriding principle of the parliamentary system of government is and must be the accountability of the executive to parliament. And I agree. Any recognition of executive privilege is an unchallengeable right to deny information to parliament is inconsistent with that fundamental principle. And it says parliament can do this and parliament can do that. But now, <coughs> what does parliament mean? Now, what I just can't do. And what we can't do is rise above the Constitution. And what does the Constitution say? So the Constitution says this. The Governor General, uh, uh, the legislative power of the Commonwealth should be vested in the Federal Parliament, which shall consist of the Queen, a Senate and the House of Representatives, and uh, which is here and after called the Parliament or the Parliament of the Commonwealth. It's not the Parliament that's called for this, it's the Senate. And you cannot, you cannot identify the Senate as the Parliament. And uh, what we need, and whether there's any rights or wrongs or whether any public interest was in this at all, if Parliament, that is if both houses called on Mrs Kelly to reveal this tape, then she'd have to do it no matter what the rights or wrongs of it. 
but the fact of the matter is that, uh, that, that Parliament hasn't done it. Parliament hasn't done it, and uh, you can't go elevating, no matter how august a chamber this is, and I've got a great respect for it, you can't elevate the Senate to the position of the Parliament. Uh, until you uh, can do that, well, in fact, you can't because the, the Constitution, which we all which we all obey, now perhaps that's, which we all obey, defines Parliament, and it defines Parliament as the two houses and the Queen. And uh, look, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Well, look, you're on a different argument. Uh, you're on a different argument, uh, Senator O'Chi. Uh, I mean, you've got to stick to the to the point I'm making, which is that uh, that Parliament that Parliament is the uh, point. If you that, that'd be all right. Now, the, the, uh, so the other, so what's happening here is that you take a, uh, you take, you're taking a person, uh, <coughs> Senator, uh, uh, Mrs. Kelly, a minister whose reputation you cannot produce any evidence to impugn, who, who, uh, who has, um, has, uh, <coughs> has, uh, at this point in time, a, uh, a, 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 the ability to stand tall as a minister, as a person, and as a uh, member of parliament. And what you hope to do is, by going on a fixing expedition, you might find something whereby you can embarrass her in the government. And that's a process that we should uh, can, uh, we should not uh, we should not tolerate. But it's one matter. It's pointed out to me that of the people there, everybody agreed it was a private meeting. In my argument, it doesn't matter whether it was or wasn't, but it was a private meeting. The only person who said it wasn't was a Paul Gilding, who wasn't at the, uh, who wasn't at the, uh, at the meeting. So anyhow, we'll hear what evidence there is to uh, <coughs> impugn uh, Mrs uh, Kelly from the speakers that follow me. And, uh, <coughs> No doubt they'll be able to lay some reasonable basis on which you can say, look, the public interest uh, uh, requires us to produce these documents. Something above and beyond the, uh, <coughs> the proposition that if we had a look, we'd be able to find something. Well, if you had a look at anybody's private papers, you're probably uh, able to find something about it. But that's not how we should operate in this House, because that leads to a complete injustice. And on that point, uh, it's not in this country that Parliament is supreme. The uh, real proposition is that the rule of law is supreme. And one of the great propositions in the rule of law under the Westminster system and the system under which we come by in the Commonwealth system is that persons are entitled to their reputation, entitled to preserve their reputation of innocence, entitled to preserve uh, their integrity of a person unless some evidence can be produced to show that they should be diminished in some way. And it's only when that evidence is produced that we can then look to, uh, to, uh, uh, to furthering that, uh, that material, not as you're doing here, making an allegation that, she, that there's something on those tapes uh, and then going on a fishing expedition hoping against hope, because it would be against hope, that you'd find something, uh, something on the tape. What we ought to uh, do, of course we won't because of the party politics in this matter, uh, we should uh, reject this motion and uh, leave Mrs Kelly, as she is with the uh, outstanding reputation she has as a minister, a member of parliament and a person. Senator Alston. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, it's been an extraordinary performance this morning, hasn't it? Uh, almost Alice in Wonderland. We've had uh, two speakers on the government side, Rumpole and Robespierre. <laughs> and, if we, and if we look at uh, what Rumpole had to say, uh, it's quite clear that he got a doc brief, which was handed back at the last minute, and I trust he'll be marking it fee declined. <laughs> it's, it's quite, it's quite unfortunate, in a sense, that uh, he feels so bound by his instructions that he had to take riding orders which told him that numbers override principles. Because if there's one thing that Senator Cooney has been noted for in this place, it's his commitment to uh, very important parliamentary principles and the rule of law, ones which I think we all hold in high regard and we hold him in high regard for advocating them. And that's why it's uh, very unfortunate that he should uh, resort to such sophistry as the proposition that somehow the overriding principle in this debate is a rule that says persons' reputations are so sacred that we shouldn't be entitled to inspect any documents. Now, whose reputation is on the line at the moment? 
What about the people who are called liars by Minister Kelly? Aren't they entitled to a fair hearing? Aren't they entitled to? Well, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to that in a moment. You see, you see, I suspect Senator Richardson's the one who really takes this view, not Senator Cooney, that uh, numbers matter before principles. Because at the end of the day, Senator Cooney knows what the responsibilities of the executive are. He understands that uh, either House of Parliament is entitled, as this one has done, to resolve that certain matters be put before it, and the obligation of the executive is to account to that House of Parliament, not to treat it with contempt, not to say we will not comply. Full stop. If you go back to the uh, 1982 uh, episode, you will find there that Senator Cheney, on behalf of the government in the Senate, uh, put the proposition that uh, these documents should not be released because it was not in the interest of the administration of justice. It might well prejudice the uh, private uh, affairs of those whose taxation details might have been disclosed, and that there was a good and proper reason in the public interest. Now we've not heard one skerrick of a defence along those lines. No, not, not uh, executive privilege, not commercial in confidence, and if you look at Senator Richardson the other day, not even a decent FOI defence. So I would have thought that uh, the moment you put in your request, you'd be insulted if they said then it was a need for an internal review. They ought to simply look at the, uh, the minister, take his word at face value and hand it over. So hopefully we won't have uh, too much longer to wait before we do get uh, the true details of this sordid of affair. So there is a public interest here. The interest in many respects lies in knowing whether uh, the Greens have been defamed by the minister and indeed in knowing what the real agenda is all about. And I think in that regard uh, it's perfectly plain what the real agenda item ought to be. It's whether Mrs Kelly is speaking with a forked tongue, whether on the one hand she's publicly uh, accepting her responsibilities of cabinet solidarity and therefore uh, supporting new federalism, on the other hand privately bagging it, telling the Greens that uh, this is all the fault of these uh, sordid premiers or indeed a prime minister who's forcing her into it. That's the issue, whether you've got a government and a minister who are singing the same song. Now, if you think that the public aren't interested in knowing whether these sort of uh, matters are real or false, then you don't have much of a concept of the public interest. So let's just look at uh, what our other friend had to contribute uh, earlier on, because I found it quite extraordinary that uh, the world's greatest self-proclaimed political fixer should somehow, somehow come into this chamber and purport to give us a lecture on parliamentary practice. Now, who, 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 who did he quote? Who did he quote? This is, the, this is the failed law student, mind you, who suddenly become an expert on constitutional law. You know who he quoted? He quoted. He, he quoted. He quoted. He quoted. I won't even bother with you. He quoted Erskine and May. Erskine and May. There's no such. There's no such publication. All of us know it's Erskine May. First name Erskine, last name May. But no, even a, even a brief stint at law school before they gave him the chop wasn't sufficient for him to understand how important that book on parliamentary pr practice is. So of course that's about the best we can get from the government in terms of an analysis of the issues. And uh, of course it's perfectly clear that uh, Senator Richardson's uh, self-serving justification ought not to be taken at face value. Indeed, uh, it's extraordinary to ask when this document was first claimed to be private. I mean, is it really private to uh, call together a meeting of all those groups around the country who have a vital interest in an issue, not say anything to them beforehand, don't say, righto chaps, off the record, without prejudice, not to say a word to your friends and relatives. You don't say any of that. You just call them in, away you go, and then at the end of the meeting, or maybe seven days later, you say, by the way, not to say a word to anyone. That's how it works. So suddenly we're having this uh, defence trotted out that this was all off the record. Now, was it? I mean, the Greens were all over the front page of the Weekend Australian, telling us chapter and verse, backing it up with the minutes of the meeting, demonstrating what they say was a very important contradiction between Minister Kelly's public position and uh, her private stance. So then we have all this other self-serving nonsense about 
This is private. This is somehow something that no one should breathe a word about. Now, if we took that at face value, what's the logical consequence? That you wouldn't release a word of it. But what did we have yesterday? They come along and give us self-serving selected extract from the very document they claim is private. In other words, because it suits their political advantage, because they got such a thrashing in the media over the last few days, they everywhere. And they decided then to selectively release a portion. Now, what's, what's privacy? Is privacy partial? Does privacy defined as releasing those parts that help me, irrespective of whether they damage someone else? Is privacy a question of deciding that there are some words here that might somehow get me off the hook politically, that we might be able to turn the tide for a day or two, so we'll breach our self-proclaimed notion of privacy and we'll trot out a few garbled and equivocal words which I would have thought, if anything, dig, dig Minister Kelly in even deeper, because they make it perfectly clear that she is fundamentally opposed to new federalism. Whatever she chooses now to say about crass politics, she is bucketing those who adhere to it. If you want to pretend she's bucketing the premiers, pretend it. But who did the deal with the premiers? The Prime Minister. So, so you've got, you've got. Well, you've uh, that point escaped me. You've uh, what you've what you've got here. <laughs> what you've got here is uh, a criticism that goes to the very heart of the government's commitment to new federalism. I mean, you can't have one party to an agreement. If the premiers are to be criticised by the minister for espousing new federalism for all those base reasons, like uh, they're interested in selling their grandmothers for a quid and all these other disgraceful uh, notions, then what's to be said about the other party to the agreement? Why did he go along with it? Do, should he still adhere to it? You can't have it both ways. Clearly, Minister Kelly is publicly undermining the, the stance of the Prime Minister on this issue. Now, She's probably taking her riding orders from uh, those who were trotting out notes to her in the House the other day. I mean, what a demeaning spectacle. You're in the Cabinet, you're up there making a speech, and here you've got Mr Keating passing you little bits of paper telling you how to, how to run your argument. I don't know what... I, 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 well, you're, enti you're entitled to have a bit of a chat, but I would have thought a minister's able to defend herself. I mean, really and truly. To, to have to rely on a piece of paper from a failed leadership pretender, and of course you're going down with him, so I can understand your concern. And uh, clearly, if that's the, the, the sort of position that Minister Kelly gets herself into, it's quite understandable that uh, she should be squirming in the way that she has been. And uh, don't, for a moment, pretend this isn't linked to the leadership. You'll remember the way in which Senator Richardson managed to beat this whole thing up to the point where Mr. Keating actually had a run. Do you know the great tactic? You go around the countryside denying that there's any such thing on the agenda, hosing it all down, supposedly, telling people that there isn't an issue, that you've heard all these rumours, but it's nonsense. And of course, all the time, you're upping the ante. You're getting people more and more excited. You're creating an environment in which you can actually have a go. Well, they had a go and they're still going out the back door. But clearly what Mrs Kelly's on about is uh, taking this sort of advice to new heights. To, to simply get out there and allow something to swing for some days, to create all the fuss and bother. Because if, if they were fair income, why wouldn't they have released even that selected piece of the transcript on day one? I mean, why choose to do it now? It's being done purely to try and deflect all the, the odium that's uh, attaching to this indefensible position. Now, I would have thought that uh, the very least we're entitled to in this chamber is a proper explanation of why the government takes the line that it does. And even taking Senator Cooney's position at its uh, highest, the very least that Senator Button could have done was to say, dear sir, you can't have the document because it's not in the public interest. Now, I would have thought that's a pretty poor defence, and you certainly wouldn't charge for drafting it. But the fact is, at least you would have offered some sort of explanation. But we didn't even get that. We got no justification at all, a studied contempt. A, a degree of arrogance that I would have thought was uh, breathtaking and quite indicative of this government's determination to tough it out, to uh, provide what information it wants to to the parliament or to either house on its terms. Now, if that's not the very antithesis of parliamentary democracy, if that's not 
flying in the face of all those principles that uh, failed law students and others think are important, then I would have thought that uh, this government doesn't even understand the basis on which uh, it <laughs> occupies those benches. So, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I would have thought if ever there was a clear-cut case of uh, a government being in an indefensible position of uh, choosing on its own terms to uh, simply be selective and ignore all the uh, precedents and practice of this chamber, then it is this government that uh, the, the motion that we are considering today and for which I commend the Democrats for supporting is one that simply makes it clear that uh, there are rights and responsibilities, that there are obligations on the executive and individual ministers to be accountable, uh, at the very least, to come into this chamber via ministers of the Crown and provide a decent explanation for the conduct that uh, they adopt. But we've had none of it. We've simply had a thumbing of their collective noses at this chamber and this parliament, and that is what we are condemning today. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, we've um, so far had nearly two hours debate on this matter, and we've had it because, of course, the opposition got a comprehensive drubbing yesterday in the House of Representatives. And the opposition—I was there, and the opposition—I uh, was in the gallery with your uh, mate, Senator Kemp, who I, I think privately agrees with me. Uh, and not only, not only point do of, I know point, it. Point of order. Point of order. It's clear that I don't privately agree with him. I don't publicly agree with him. I've never agreed with him. There's no point of. There's no point of order, Senator Kemp. <laughs> Senator Faulkner. You've kept my integrity intact, uh, Senator Kemp. The, uh, and not only, of course, Madam Acting Deputy President, do I know you got a comprehensive drubbing. But you know you got a comprehensive drubbing, as so does every journalist in this country. And if you don't believe me, go and read, go and read the morning newspapers today. But of course, we, uh, we had a, a, another lily-livered attack from Senator Alston on those on this, from this side of the House who have made outstanding contributions to today's debate, Senator Richardson and Senator Cooney. But what about the performance put up by the opposition? I mean, a few lightweights have come. A few lightweights have uh, come into the uh, attack for the opposition. We've had uh, we've had we've had Senator Ochi. We've had Senator Ochi in his usual fourth place youth world debating championship style, who comes in here all the time and says uh, and and tells the Senate how he, how he represents the young people of this nation and has never once, well, has never once put the effective? truth before the Senate. That is, that he represents the most corrupt branch of the most corrupt political party in the Western world. Point of order. Deputy President, uh, Senator Faulkner is either saying I'm corrupt or that my representation is corrupt. And of course, both comments and either comment is totally unparliamentary and highly, uh, highly unsatisfactory. And I'd ask you to direct him to withdraw that, uh, those offensive and objectionable words. Se Senator Faulkner, Senator Chi has taken offence at the remarks you've made. Uh, I ask you to withdraw them. I was attacking the Queensland National Party, but if, but if, if, it, if it is unparliamentary. I will withdraw it, Madam no, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Faulkner. And then, of course, we had uh, then, of course, we had uh, Senator Alston, and uh, he doesn't know what these references to uh, about casino are. Well, let me tell you, Senator Alston, one of your recent achievements in the last few weeks. Senator Alston went on a trip to casino. I'll do with the debate. This is a censure motion against the government for the government failing to comply with an order of the Senate. What has that got to do with Senator Alston? Well, well, Senator Hill, I, I suggest uh, Senator Faulkner be allowed to continue, and he can show us what the relevance is. And if he doesn't, well, it'll be stopped. 
you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm commenting on the contributions of other senators to the debate. And uh, I must say, you've got a bigger crowd in here uh, in your contribution to this morning's debate, Senator Alston, than you managed in your well publicised uh, public meeting in Casino when absolutely no one fronted to listen to you. And What's the relevance of that to whether or not the government should be censured? Is, is that your best point? Well, well Senator, Senator, Hill, Senator Faulkner is not, not far into his speech. And he, he is entitled to make some reference to other participants who have participated in the debate. He is not entitled to give his entire speech on that matter, but he is not far into his speech. And he is, as I, as I understand it thus far, uh, trying to make some reference to other participants in the debate and no doubt will go on to make some reference to what they have said. And I might say, President, he has gone for five minutes and has not presented one argument. Well, Sen Senator Hill, Senator Faulk Faulkner is entitled to speak for 30 minutes. It, he, he has not gone for five minutes. The clock has gone for nearly five, but a good deal of that time has take, been taken up with interjections and points of order. If Senator Faulkner is allowed to continue, I will do my best to ensure that he keeps relevant. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As I said, uh, as I said that we, we have, uh, we have, we are. We are having this debate in the Senate today because of the pathetic performance of the opposition in the House of Representatives yesterday, when Senator Cheney blew himself, when, when ex Senator Cheney, when ex Senator Cheney blew himself comprehensively out of the water, and uh, and this was of course going to be Senator, uh, ex Senator Cheney's comeback performance. It was going to be his comeback performance after his uh, disastrous effort with the, uh, the uh, Peacock-Howard uh, coup, which, of course, you are one person, Senator Bishop, who suffered very much as a result of that. And I know, I know, Madam Acting Deputy President, that Senator Hill, of course, is an unreconstructed Cheneyite. I know that, and I know that he was always going to defend ex-Senator Cheney. Point of, point of order, Senator well, Brownhill. I, I just uh, ask you to rule on the point of relevance to the debate, which was uh, moved here this morning by. <laughs> Senator Hill, I don't think there's any relevance to any of the matters that uh, Senator Faulkner is talking about. Yes, uh, Senator Brownhill, um, there's no point of order, but Senator Faulkner, ma matters might proceed more smoothly if you could uh, give, give an immediate indication uh, a, as you speak as to, as to the relevance of your remarks to the debate. I'd also uh, point out, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that in the House of Representatives there was a motion of lack of confidence in Mrs Kelly, and that motion was defeated. There was also, Madam Acting Deputy President, a motion, a motion that the tapes that seemed to obsess senators on the other side of this chamber be tabled, and that motion was defeated. The House of Representatives has expressed its view on both those matters. But the main, I was going to make a very brief contribution, uh, Madam Acting Deputy <laughs> President, but I have been, of course, uh, interrupted uh, continually by members of the, uh, by members of the opposition. But the main point I wanted to make, Madam Acting Deputy President, is the absolute hypocrisy of these people, the absolute hypocrisy of these people because of what happened in late 1982 over documents, of course, that related to bottom of the harbour tax schemes. And it was these hypocrites, these hypocrites, who at that time, who at that time, as members of the Fraser government, as members of the Fraser government, order, who order, would order, not order, Senator, Senator Faulkner. It is not appropriate to refer to other members of this chamber as hypocrites, and I ask you withdraw. Well, I withdraw that. Uh, Thank you. <laughs>
Well, I'd always be guilty if you were the judge and jury, let's face it. But, uh, but um, Madam Acting Deputy President, it is utterly hypocritical, utterly hypocritical for opposition senators and the opposition to argue in this case that a tape should be tabled. It is utterly hypocritical for them to do that. And they know it. They know that they did not conform with an order of the Senate in 1982. And for them to come into this chamber today for about the fifth bite of the cherry after the House of Representatives has made a decision on both these matters is a complete waste of time. They, they tried to attack a minister of this government. Well, they fluffed it. They fluffed it. They have tried to have the tapes tabled. They have fluffed it. They've lost, they've lost it. Game, set and match. And I think, Madam Acting Deputy President, it's time to get on to the next item of business. Senator Kemp. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I rise to support the motion before the Chamber to um, censure the government for its uh, refusal to table the uh, tape. Uh, Madam Chair, there is no question. Madam Chair, there is no question that this tape or its transcript will finally be produced. It will be produced under an FOI order or by an order of the court or ultimately by this chamber. But this, this tape, but the facts that this tape will reveal will certainly become public in, not, in the not too distant future. And I thought it was sad today, to sad today, to listen to this debate and to listen to the performance uh, by the minister and his uh, supporters on uh, why this particular document should not be produced today. And I think it was very telling, very telling, that in the letter to the clerk of the house from Senator Button, that no reason was given for refusing to produce the tape. No reason was tendered by the leader of the government in this uh, place for not producing the uh, tape. None whatsoever. And so we listen carefully. We listen carefully to the, the, the minister. We listen carefully to Senator Cooney. Uh, we listened uh, caref carefully to Senator Faulkner to see what the reasons were. Because I suggest to you, uh, Madam Chair, this is a matter of uh, high constitutional interest and of high constitutional practice. It is not a trivial issue. And the reason that uh, the minister gave us was that the House had decided, the other place had decided, not to produce, not to produce the tapes. And this, by some uh, peculiar misquote from Erskine May, was deemed to be. No, I think, as you pointed out, it, uh, Erskine May, Erskine May, as. Uh, you didn't dispute the quote. The, uh, the, the, mis, the misquote and highly selective quote failed to, tra to uh, tackle, uh, Madam Chair, the uh, substantive point. And the substantive point is this: that this chamber, this Senate, has the right to uh, determine its own rules and it has the right to manage its own business. And if we accepted the argument of the minister, there would be no reason for this particular chamber to exist, because once, that, once the other place had determined its view on a bill, on a particular matter of public importance, that, as far as the minister is concerned, is sufficient and therefore binds this chamber. I don't believe in the history of Federation there would be any other minister who would come in and make such a stupid, silly argument. Because, the, because on 20 previous occasions, on 20 previous occasions, 20 previous governments, Senator Cooney, 20 previous governments have obeyed the order of the Senate and produced documents. So how can you, how can you come in here? How can you come in here and, and argue that the Senate does not have these particular powers? Were 20 other governments quite wrong, were they? 20 other governments wrong. 20, 20 other governments wrong. And so the point I'm making, it is an extraordinary thing about this, this uh, particular debate that this document uh, and the tapes and the transcripts uh, which are now available, 
available to certain selected people, but not apparently but not apparently to the Prime Minister, not apparently to the ministers who are standing up in the other place and in this chamber and defending Senator uh, Ros Kelly. All of them have been very careful to avoid making any claim uh, that they have actually read the heard the tapes or read the transcripts. They are prepared to come in here and come into the other place and uh, Defend Mrs. Kelly, defend her without having taken the trouble, without having taken the trouble to actually listen to or read what those transcripts contained. Somewhat extraordinary, I would have thought. Somewhat extraordinary. And we are therefore entitled, I think, to, to speculate, to speculate on what is on these tapes. We now have before us. We have exactly three minutes. Uh, th uh, sorry, three sentences from a transcript which went on for three hours. So we are quite entitled to speculate what is precisely on these tapes. What is the government afraid of? What, what is the government afraid of? What, uh, what particular item of information? What particular item of information is contained on these tapes? Is the government and is Mrs Kelly worried about, for example, the robust language that she used, uh, reportedly used during the three hours meeting. Very robust indeed. And, and, we have a slight, and we have a slight hint at the sort of language that Mrs Kelly uses when we read those three sentences, I suggest, where she accused uh, uh, many of her Labor colleagues, Labor premiers, as being willing to sell their mothers for order, the big dollar. Order. That, that's the sort of language. That's the Order. sort of language that we have a hint of, Should and we have reports it. that Mrs. Kelly apparently used uh, during this three-hour meeting. Maybe, maybe this uh, tape revealed the nature of uh, the grubby deals which this government has done with uh, various green groups uh, prior to the last election. Maybe, maybe there was a fairly vigorous exchange on that particular issue. Maybe, maybe there were some comments about the money which the government had paid out to some of these groups and the trade-offs which, which were required. Maybe there was a fairly vigorous exchange on that particular issue. How interesting it would be for the public, Senator Cooney, how interesting for the public and talking about public interest to explore those particular issues, because we know that the man in charge of that was none other than the minister at the table, uh, uh, Senator Richardson. So we're, we're, in, I, we're entitled to, to think and speculate about uh, what, what was on that tape. Uh, I was intrigued by um, Senator Faulkner's comments that, uh, about uh, the, the, uh, the nature of the debate uh, yesterday, yesterday and then the other uh, place and, and uh, what was the final results of it. And he urged us to look at the press. Well, Senator Faulkner, I looked at the press and here we are in the Australian Kelly Keating out on a limb. Now, I have to suggest, in view of your interest in this particular matter, in view of your strong support for Mr Hawke, there is one thing that you wouldn't be worried about, let me tell you, is Kelly and Keating being out on a limb. And can I suggest to you that uh, it is maybe in the fullness of time, can we possibly speculate that uh, the Prime Minister himself, if he takes the trouble to read the full text of that, uh, of that transcript? Well, I'm not too sure, sure, sure that he's not. I think that it would be quite clear with the factional plays in the Labor Party, and we all know on this side of the chamber how hard those factional plays are becoming. And all of us have experienced and had chats with uh, members over the other side. But unlike Senator Faulkner, unlike Senator Faulkner, I'm not going to uh, comment on anything which may be private or that may be not private. <laughs> But I, can I say that all of us have experienced on this side of the chamber some pretty robust comments from members on the other side about the nature of the factional fighting. And so I suggest to you it is possible that uh, Mr Hawke, in the fullness of time as this issue heats up, and let me tell you it is going to heat up, it is not over by any stretch of the imagination, Mr Hawke himself may be uh, prepared to insist that the documents be tabled. Uh, and I was noted in the front page of the Canberra Times, which we've all read. Uh, we all read uh, in the morning. Uh, Mr. Hawke is quoted as saying this: "I would not be unhappy if she, meaning Mrs. Kelly, tabled the relevant transcript." He declared, "I, I entirely agree with it." Well, there's a there's a little chink. There's a, the door being put slightly ajar. 
And, uh, I suggest to Mr Hawke that uh, uh, the public would at least want to know uh, why he uh, has not, not uh, bothered to read the transcript, why the minister, the leader of the government in this House has not bothered to, to read the transcript. And remember, colleagues, he was asked twice by Senator Reid yesterday in question time uh, whether he had bothered to read the transcript, and uh, Senator Button was very careful to make it very clear that no minister has, has yet bothered to read the full transcript. So, so, Senator Cooney, where does that leave the public interest? Who, who can judge? Your own people, your own people are too scared to read this transcript. And I tell you, I bet they've got jolly good reason to be. Can I, can I say that? So uh, I think we are entitled. This, this is a vital issue of constitutional practice. The Senate is entitled to pursue this matter with, uh, with great vigour, and the Senate will. Senator Faulkner raised, raised some, some issues with us uh, concerning what happened in uh, uh, 1992. He said very boldly, waved, waved a bit of paper around, and said, "What happened in, uh, in 1982?" I stand corrected, and uh, I can draw him to some interesting quotes by his colleague Senator Evans, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. And uh, if, uh, as you've drawn that particular debate to our attention, uh, uh, may, I, uh, may I read into the transcript of this debate? what your Minister for Foreign Affairs now said on that particular occasion. And, and this is what he said. Uh, it is only by access to these documents that it will be possible now, given the attitude of the government has taken, for an, an objective view to be reached as to where the merits and the truth lie. Ring, ring, ring a somewhat uh, familiar uh, bell, does it? Uh, if the government is, has anything to hide. Senator Cooney, this is, this is what, uh, what your uh, shadow attorney general said then. I can understand its continued reluctance to make the documents available. If the government believes, however, that its ministers and senior officials have acted throughout reasonably and with a proper sense of responsibility to the public at large, the government should not hesitate uh, for one second to put these documents in the public domain to enable the truth of that perception to be established once and for all. Not a, not a bad quote I wouldn't have thought from Senator Evans uh, at, in uh, 1982. And thank you, Senator Faulkner, for drawing our attention to it. And he concluded, and he concluded if there is any uh, constitutional issue involved here, it is the right of this parliament to demand accountability from the executive. I would have thought, I would have thought that was a, a fairly devastating quote from another man who holds himself out to be uh, an eminent uh, legal expert. Not as eminent, I regret to say, as I've often thought Senator Cooney, and I, uh, I certainly, sort of, uh, having served uh, with him on, on a number of committees, that I was felt that he, he was a man of, of great principle and a, a man of great learning. And I'd have to say that I'd have to say, Senator Cooney, uh, that uh, I thought I thought the, 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 the contribution that you made today, order, the contribution order, order, you made today, will not stand up well. When, when, the, when the particular history of this period is written, and I'm, I'm sorry for that, because the, the contributions you often make are, are, are of, of great worth and of great merit. So, can I say that, I, uh, uh, that uh, Mr. Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President, Mr. Deputy President, that I strongly support the motion before the chair. Uh, whether this motion is won or lost, Senator Cooney, let me tell you, it will not end the issue. Senator uh, Walters. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. The seriousness of the censure motion before the Senate can't be emphasised too much. On Tuesday, the Senate directed that the government release the, the uh, tape recordings taken according to the minister by her department at a meeting that took place between the major conservation movement uh, representatives and the minister. The refusal of the government to comply with the direction of the Senate has put it in contempt. We know that there have been 19 previous occasions when that request in the history of Australia has been complied with. We know that when one request, similar request occurred in 1975 and the Whitlam government refused, they went to the people and were defeated. 
Senator Faulkner today has spoken about 1982. On that occasion, the request was made by the Labour Party for the bottom of the Harbour Papers to be um, brought before the Senate. At that time, the executive opposed that on the grounds that the disclosure of the documents would have been harmful to the administration of justice because many of those cases were before the court. So it was against public interest. It was for the saving of public interest that that was opposed on that occasion. On this occasion, what has the government put forward as their excuse for not bringing forward the tapes at the uh, direction of the Senate. And I have to read from Senator Button's letter in response to our, uh, our direction from the Senate to say, and he says, I have noted the text of the order and advised the Senate that the government will not be tabling the tape recording to which it refers. No excuse at all just blatant arrogance by the minister that they have no intention of complying with the order. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, Senator Cooney disappointed me considerably in his contribution because what he did was to express the philosophy of the Labor Party very clearly. What he said was, the only thing that concerns us in this place are the numbers. Yesterday, in the House of Representatives, the motion of censure against the, uh, the minister was lost because of the numbers, nothing else, because of the numbers. And we're not going to give you those documents because we won't do it. You can request it but it comes down to numbers and numbers only. And because they've got the numbers in the House of Representatives, they don't intend to comply with the direction of the Senate. There was nothing in his contribution about the executive's accountability to the parliament. Nothing at all about that. What he said was, we on this side do what we are told. Nothing more, nothing less. We don't express our personal opinion, whether it's on principle or otherwise, we vote according to how we are told. Well, yes, we are different on this side of the chamber, because that is not the case. On this side of the chamber, if it comes to a matter of principle, then we vote the way our principle and our conscience tells us. Senator, Senator Cooney acknowledged today that numbers, the philosophy of the Labour Party were, that numbers were more important than philosophy, that, than principle. And that is exactly what he said. Numbers are more important than principle. Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, as you know only too well because it happened very recently, we had some legislation in this place on tobacco advertising, and several of our, uh, our senators crossed the floor and voted against their party on that particular issue, because for them it was a matter of principle and they were permitted to do so. I have crossed the floor on several occasions, one on the matter of the referendum. Because for me it was a matter of principle, not numbers, but a matter of principle. And I have crossed the floor on occasions in this parliament. I am still here. My colleagues who crossed the floor are still here. And unfortunately, the only member of the Labour Party who had the courage to cross the floor on any issue, Senator Georges, was expelled from the Labour Party as a result of him crossing the floor. That's the sort of democracy 
we know and we have learnt that the Labor Party indulges in. Vote for a principle against your numbers and you'll be expelled. Now, the Democrats, they don't do that. They often divide on issues. At least they know what democracy, true democracy on principle is about. We on this side have that opportunity. The Democrats have that opportunity, but in the Labor Party there is no such thing as principle. Well, let's have a look at the history of this uh, situation. Order. Senator Faulkner. The number of points of order were taken on me during this debate for relevance. Thank I take you, the Martin. same point uh, on Senator Walters' uh, very interesting excursion around uh, who did and did not cross the floor of Parliament. Yeah, well, I, I'm just I, the point. Senator Faulkner, I, I was in the chamber when those comments were made, and I, I take note of what the uh, acting deputy president at the time said. Uh, that I don't believe there's any point of order, but I would ask uh, Senator Walters to um, to move to move to uh, to the subject at hand. Well, I thought that uh, I was Mr. Acting President because I was commenting, indeed, so very clearly on Senator Kearney's contribution. The only excuse that has been put up by the government or by the minister in defence of not supplying the tapes, and that isn't officially with a letter to the Senate but in debate in the other place, was that the uh, tapes were private. We had Senator Richardson today say that the conservation movement don't want the tapes revealed. That is not true. That is just frankly not true. Indeed, the conservationists present have released their minutes, have released their minutes, which confirm their opinion of what occurred at that meeting. They have asked for the tapes to be released and have said that until they are released, then a cloud hangs over their head because the minister has accused them of lying. The minister was the first to bring the uh, meeting into the public arena. The conservationists objected to her, co uh, to her calling them liars, and so the, uh, the fight has gone on. The fact that the prime minister has released only one very small section of a transcript, not of the tape, but of a transcript of the tape, leaves the situation where today in The Australian, Len Milne says, the part of the transcript released by, by Hawke confirms that Kelly criticised the new federalism process, but with the weight of that criticism directed against the premiers rather than the prime minister. The fact that the rest of the tape remains under wraps only keeps suspicion and the issue alive. If Kelly has nothing to hide, which she says is the case, she'd be better off complying with the directive of the Senate and giving up the tape. And Mr Acting President, until that is done, until the executive decide that they are responsible to the people of Australia, to the Parliament of Australia. They have not got the luxury of saying, as Senator Button has said, that they just don't intend to release the tapes with no excuse at all. The Senate will pursue the issue and on behalf of the people of Australia. Senator Macdonald. Acting Deputy President, uh, in this uh, debate, which uh, from this side has been uh, a very careful uh, uh, analysis of the uh, questions before us, my colleagues have made the very telling points about what this particular uh, motion is all about. And it's uh, summed up, I suppose, in one word, and that is the absolute arrogance and contempt which the Labor Party and the government hold uh, for the people of Australia as represented by the pe people uh, in this parliament. And that's what this is all about the absolute contempt that uh, the Labor Party hold the people of Australia in, the absolute arrogance 
that they show to the people of Australia. Now, if the ACTU says to this government, jump, this government says, how high? They are not at all interested in doing what's right, but they are beholden to their masters in the ACTU. It's very clearly to understand why in this chamber, when you just have a look at the background of the senators on the government side here, and a good majority of them are only here because they owe their allegiance to the ACTU and the union movement. And those that aren't are only here because they've been party hacks who've come up through the paid offices of the ALP and got a sinecure in this joint here. And that's what the ALP is all about. They are beholden to the Labor Party and the union movement. That's all they're interested in. When they when they want to do things for in government, do they do what's right or do they do what's told of them by the union movement? And who elects the union movement? Who elects the union movement? A few people vote sometimes, but you've only got to look at the Cook inquiry in Queensland to see that many of the union uh, elections are full of rorts and uh, shady dealings. Nobody elects them except a few little people with very narrow interests, with their own power bases in mind, who have no idea, no interest in the real interests of what's good Order. for Australia. Uh, Senator Faulkner. I'm not uh, at all concerned about the unkind comments Senator Macdonald's making, but I make the same point about relevance that was, has been made a number of occasions during this uh, debate. Um, look, there's no point of order, Senator, Senator Faulkner, but. Uh, I've noticed during this debate that uh, speakers from both sides of the House have ranged far and wide on the subject, and I would ask Senator Macdonald that uh, you try to keep your remarks to the, to the matter at hand. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. What I was pointing out, and that Senator Faulkner knows but doesn't want it repeated and doesn't want it enunciated, is that the Labor Party and the government are beholden not to the people of Australia but to the union movement and the few people, the few people of Australia who control that union movement. This, this country should be run by the people of Australia as, as they are represented in this parliament. Now, this parliament, a good majority of oh, Australians, too many interjections from both sides. A good majority of Australians have elected by a good majority senators to this chamber from the Liberal Party, the Democrat Party, and the National Party. Those people represent the views of well over 50 per cent of Australians, and those people have said to this government, "We want you to do something." We want you to do something that is not protected by privilege. It's not something of uh, grave commercial or, or, or national uh, uh, secrecy. We want you to do something. And what does this government say to the people of Australia, as represented by the senators here asking for that? Go and shove it. That's what the Labor Party have said. They are not interested. They are not interested in what the people of Australia want. They only are interested in what they are told to do by their union mates and the little coitery of people who control them, who have them put into this place. When the parliament, when the people of Australia say do something, this government ignores it completely. And Mr Deputy President, that is my concern that this government, and it's a concern that is well brought out in this motion, supported by the Democrats and identified by them as well, that this parliament, the people of Australia, have asked the government to do something. The government has ignored it completely, and the motion, amongst other things, notes with great concern the government's belief that it's not accountable to the people of Australia through uh, parliament. And so, Mr Deputy President, it's appropriate that this Senate again flexes its uh, muscles, shows its relevance by censuring the government, as is called upon by this motion, for its unjustified failure to comply with the Senate resolution. And it also, uh, Mr Deputy President, this Senate calls upon the government to comply with the resolution and table that tape. And Mr Deputy President, that's why it's important, again, that the majority of this parliament, the majority of people of Australia, do demand that the government take notice of the people of Australia and tape, uh, table the tape. Um, Senator Hill. Um, I don't wish to further speak on the debate. No. Um, the case has been put most ably by those on this side of the chamber. Mr. Thank, Thank you. President. Well, the question is that the uh, motion moved by Senator Hill be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No, 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 no. Noes have it. Division required.
Ring the bells. Lock the doors. Order the question is that the motion moved by Senator Hill be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Knowles, teller for the ayes, and Senator Faulkner, teller for the noes.
Order. Result of the division there being 28 ayes and 20 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Calder. And, uh, continuing with that matter, I seek, uh, seek leave to move a further motion. Order. Sure the Order. Senate, Senator Calder, just resume your seat just for one second. Senator Niles. May I seek leave just to make a very short statement on that division? It's leave granted. Leave granted. Senator Niles. Thank you, Mr President. I just uh, wish to draw to the attention of the Senate that uh, there were an extraordinarily large number of pairs for that particular division, and uh, that was purely and simply to facilitate uh, many of the government ministers uh, to be able to go to a funeral today, and that, in fact, opposition senators were present, and uh, it was just a courtesy extended to the government. Thank you. Senator Calder. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I seek leave to move a motion and assure the Senate that uh, the disposal of this motion won't take very long. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Calder. Uh, I move, uh, Mr. Chairman, that there be laid on the table before the next day of sitting the latest draft of the intergovernmental agreement on the environment. Question, Senator Hill. And I move that that, uh, that debate be adjourned, Mr. President. I do so because. Uh, uh, it's something that should be carefully considered, whilst on the one hand we're concerned by this select process the government has in which uh, privileged groups are given special information that's not given to the public. We nevertheless think it's better that the government have the opportunity to voluntarily put this document on the table. During the week, up weeks, it'll have the occasion to do so. If it fails to do so, we will address it upon our return. The question is... Yeah, the question is the debate be now adjourned. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Petitions.